Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another lesson. Today, we will begin chapter 20. Last week, we finished chapter 19. In that chapter, we finalized the last part of the lesson was the power of the Jewish heart, that <clears throat> the person's godly soul may be in prison. But when the test, when a, pen, a person is in the trenches, so to say, it will untie itself and spring forward with unwillingness to disobey God. This is what, the, so therefore there is something unique. You cannot destroy the godly soul or the expression of the godly soul in the heart. In tonight and the next five chapters, actually, we're getting into a philosophical discussion. Some students or some teachers call it a very deep discussion. I feel that it's very exciting because I believe people who are making the time to travel and be here, some are coming from very far, some are not, but people so they come to study and gain some new understanding in their relationship with God. So therefore, I do feel that it's an exciting discussion on studying. The rabbi is going to talk about the first two commandments in the Ten Commandments that are the root and the encapsulation of the entire relationship with God. The rabbi is going to talk about the power of speech and what's the value of one word, one word in our life. We will do some math when we get there. And the rabbi is going to talk about what happens to us sometimes that we are lost of words. We cannot express ourselves. When someone's heart is filled with emotions, sometimes people cry, tears of joy. Sometimes people are silent out of sadness if i i know because i'm I've been asked when i go to visit people who face tragedies there's no word sometimes i'm just there with silence what happened to the to the idea that we lose we lose the ability to express ourselves with words based on understanding the way god created us it will enable us to have a deeper deeper understanding the topics, this the, the the above four ideas are being discussed in this chapter, chapter 20. However, chapter 21 and 22, 20, 21, and 22, 23, and then 24, the rabbi will summarize everything we studied and will bring this with many other details. So I'd like to begin. We're gonna read the introduction and then we will uh, read the text of the rabbi. In the previous, I'm reading on page 279. In the previous chapters, the Alter Rebbe discussed, uh, discussed the Torah's assertion that it is very near to us to fulfill all the commandments with a love and fear of God. If you remember, the basic of the basic tenant of the entire book of Tanya is based on the book of, uh, on the verse in Deuteronomy that it is very near to you to serve, obey God in your heart, mouth, and action. He explained that it is indeed very near by means of a, the natural love of God inherent in every Jew. He further, he further states that, stated that this love stems from the faculty of Chochmah of the divine soul in which the light of the ends of his clothes. And we discussed that there is a hidden love that is inborn with every person and therefore it's naturally as the ability to connect to God. This love is the source of a Jew's power of self-sacrifice. It is what inspires every Jew regardless of spiritual stature to forfeit his life rather than deny God's unity. In fact, were a Jew to feel that sin tears him away from God, he would never sin. His love of God and his fear of separation from him would not permit it. 
it is only the spirit of folly inspired by the klipa, the self-delusion that sin does not awaken his attachment to God that allows them to sin. We discussed it at length, we discussed it at length in the last few weeks that the idea of sin is actually creating a separation between me and God. The only reason a person is able to sin is because they are fooling themselves, thinking to themselves that they are not separated from God. But when he is confronted with an attempt to coerce him to practice idolatry, for example, no such delusion, delusion is possible. Clearly, he's been torn away from God. Thereupon, a Jew's inherent love of God is aroused, and even the most hardened sinner willingly suffers martyrdom for his faith in the, in the one God. So when we are put against the wall with a test, are, are we going to believe in God or are we be willing to separate ourselves from God? A Jew will never be willing to separate himself. This same power of self-sacrifice, says the Alter Rebbe, can enable a Jew to refrain from every transgression and fulfill all the commandments. But if, in fact, only a clear challenge to one's faith, such as idolatry, arouses and activates one's hidden love, how can this love serve as motives to motive to motivate one's observance of all the commandments? The Alder Rebbe begins to provide the answer in this chapter by explaining the relationship of all the positive commandments to the precept of believing God's unity. Stated in the first of the Ten Commandments, I am you, God, I'm, you, I'm God, you Lord. So when we understand our relationship with God and the way God created the universe, it enables us to understand how foolish it is when someone commits a sin. And of all the prohibitive commandments to the prohibition of idolatry, the second commandment in the, the, the the Decalogue, you shall have no other gods. Here is the Rebbe's talk, and we will dissect and, and explain it in details. Everybody hot, or I'm the only one? We just fixed the AC today, so. The rabbi starts, chapter 20. It is well known that the positive commandment to believe in God's unity and the admon admonition concerning idolatry, which form the first two commandments in the da Decalogue, I am God and you shall have no other gods, comprise the entire Torah. Let's start. How many commandments God gave us, Ali? 613. In the word Torah, if you try, if you convert it to numbers, how much do you get from the word Torah? Taf is 400, Vav is 6, Resh is 200, and He is 11. How much you get? 611. Torah is 611. In the book of Deuteronomy, God tells us in the last portion, Bracha, Torah Tziva Lanu Moshe Morasha Keilat Yaakov. The Torah that Moshe had commanded us is an inheritance to all the house of Jacob. Anybody is familiar with this verse? Uh, Dick, do you, are you familiar with the Torah Tziva Lanu? Leon, are you familiar with this verse? Say it again, please. Torah Tziva Lanu Moshe, the Torah that Moshe had commanded us. Morasha Keilat Yaakov. Morasha is inheritance to the household, to the family of Jacob. It's in the book of Deuteronomy towards the end, the last portion. What it means is the five books of Moses, right? We call the Torah the five books of Moses, even though God gave it to us. God told Moses what to write in the five books, but he gave it to Moshe. Moshe is the one who gave it to us as a gift. Now, 
from the Ten Commandments that we spoke, some of you are a little more advanced in the Torah knowledge, so you should be able to answer. How many of the Ten Commandments the Jewish people heard directly from God? The first two. The other eight, Moshe had to give them. Why? Because the first two is the foundation that includes, all-inclusive, all of the 613 commandments. So if God himself spoke this two, how many commandments you have left? 613 minus two? 611. That's why it's called Torah. Torah, Tzivalanu Moshe, the Torah that Moshe was teaching us because Moshe was teaching us the 611, the first two, Moshe didn't need to teach us. We heard it directly from God. The other eight are also general precepts. They are all, all the 10 commandments include every part of the Torah, all the 613. And there are rabbis, there are commentators who point out each one of the 613, where is it rooted in one of the 10 commandments? For example, thou shall not lie. One of the commands are not to lie, is including judging and law and order, obeying the law, etc. Each one of the 610 commandments, you can find it hinted to in one of the 10 commandments. However, we're going to go back to the first two. The first two are unique because God spoke directly to the Jewish people. The other two, the other eight, God spoke to Moshe and Moshe said it to the Jewish people. So if you take 613 commandments and you take out two, you have 611. What's so unique about them? If you want to know any one of God's commandments, you look at the first two. The commandments God gave us, the 613, are divided into two categories. The positive, 248, and the prohibitions. Or some call it negative. They are not negative commandments. They are prohibition. The prohibition are 365. Together, they comprise the word, the, the 613. By the way, how many letters are there in the, ten, in the Ten Commandments? Anybody knows? I've shared before, 620. If you take the Ten Commandments, you count the letters, you'll get 620. Why? You have 613 commandments and there are seven rabbinic additions. Washing hands before bread is rabbi's addition. Reading Megillah and Purim is rabbi's addition. Halel and Rosh Chodesh is Rabbi's addition. There are seven commandments that are rabbinic addition. We're not going to discuss them now, but together we have 620 commandments. They correspond to 620 letters in 10 commandments. The rabbi is going to go back to those two, the first two. The first one is I am your God. The second was the second one is there is no other God. One is in a positive, the other is in a negative. Let's find out what the rabbi has to say. For the commandment, I am God, contains all the 248 positive precepts, while the commandment, you shall have no other gods, contains all the 365 prohib prohibitive commandments. That is why we heard only these two commandments, I am and you shall not have any other gods, directly from God, while the other eight commandments were transmitted by Moshe, as our sages have said, for they are the sum total of the whole Torah. The entire Torah was given to us by Moshe. Therefore, Moshe had to give us the other eight. The Jewish people was too frightful to, to hear God speak the other outside those two. Thus, we actually heard the entire Torah from God himself, for all the commandments are contained within these two, as are particulars within a generalization. Therefore, Joseph's one's love of God motivates him to obey these two commandments, even at the expense of his life, it may also serve to motivate them to observe all the commandments. What the rabbi is saying is, every one of the commandments God gave us, there is the positive and there is the prohibitive. There are details of the I am you God and thou shall not worship any other God. However, this concept requires further clarification. 
why should all the positive precepts be considered as affirmation of God's unity? And why should all the prohibitive be manifestation of idol worship? How is it possible God says don't steal? And if I steal, I am disobeying God in the essence of I am you God. I still believe in God, but I don't necessarily have to do everything he says. I can say I love my uh, spouse. That's not me, but uh, I wouldn't say that. But somebody can say I love my spouse, but still I do it doesn't mean I have to agree on everything. It doesn't mean that I have to do everything she, she or she, uh, he or she asked me to do. The question that comes here, we are told that you want to know how do you fulfill the first commandment of time you got? By uh, studying Torah, by praying to God, by keeping kosher, by being kind to one another. And the question is, what's the relationship between those details? In addition to the idea, sometimes it's such my... my I have to take it. How is it possible with a small mitzvah, I take a dime or a quarter and I put in tzedakah or I help someone with a good advice, I am fulfilling the commandment, I am you God. And that's what in essence the Torah, the Kabbalah teaches us that mm -hmm. every one of the 613 commandments is details in one of the two, either the first or the second. And that's what the rabbi is going to be dealing with. The Mechilta, which is a commentary to the Torah, illustrates this idea by the parable of a king who entered a land and was requested by the populace to provide them with a system of laws. To this, the king replied, first accept me as your king. Afterwards, I'll issue my decrees. In the same way, believing one in the one God constitutes the foundation upon which all the other commandments are built. But why should the two commandments regarding God's unity be considered the sum total of the entire Torah? All the other commandments being merely an extension of them. The rabbi is saying, I understand why God says, I'm your God. You should not worship any other God. Because if you want to have a relationship with God, first accept him as your God. So that makes sense. Just like a king, and the Medrash brings an example, a king is traveling to an island, and the people at the island want them to his sovereignty to rest, to be over them, to rest over them. He says, first, send me a letter in which, or a decree, in a, um, a, 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 an acceptance of my rulership, and then I will show with you my laws and my requirements and, and all the benefits that come. So we need to accept God first, and we need to not worship any other God because that is, so to say, contradicting God. But why is this when I give tzedakah or I give someone good advice or I keep Shabbat, I am serving God in the level of I am you God, the first one of the two, of, uh, either one of the two commandments. The explanation is based on a deeper understanding of the concept of the unity of God. God's unity means not only that there is but one creator, but that God is the only existing being. All of existence is absolutely nullified before him and completely one with him. Therefore, I'll explain it in a moment. Therefore, when one acts in defiance of God's will, as expressed in the commandments, he sets himself apart from God as though he were a separate and independent entity. This constitutes a denial of God's unity and the transgressor is therefore considered an idolater. This the Alter Rebbe now explain in detail. I'm going to show it to you on a, a, an introduction so that we can flow. Dick, you had a question? Yes. Um, um, if I, if I shine, All right. You could be malicious towards somebody in the ocean, or on the other hand, you could be down the street and walk past the bakery and your robot overcomes you when you're running and you buy a treat, don't. Right. Very good. Self-contradictory. The Gemara calls it a thief when he's breaking, about to be breaking the safe, he's praying to God for success. So we, we, the, the Tanya is dealing with this. 
But I want to go back to what we're discussing here. We're going into a very deep philosophical discussion. I don't want to get into all the details because it's late in the evening. Everybody had a full day. However, this is one of the fundamental of Tanya. Based on that, we will be able to flow with the next few ideas. So what the rabbi is saying is, when we say Shema Israel, have you heard the prayer Shema Israel? Everybody's familiar? Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, God is our Lord. Hashem Echad, God is one. What do you mean God is one? When I say God is one, it means one and not two, right? That's the, Harry, is that correct? When we say in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, it appears to be in places that God is one and there is none else. Are you familiar with that phrase? Anybody familiar with that? None else? The simple translation is the way I just shared with you. God is one, meaning there is no two gods. God is the only king and none else, meaning there is no other deities. There is no other idol, uh, uh, gods. The Hasidic Kabbalistic interpretation is totally different. And it is an eye opening. You may not be comfortable with this at first, but once it settles in, it will address many, many questions. Kabbalah says when we say God is one, it means one and none else. None else, not no other deities. There is no other existence. There is no universe, there are no galaxies, there is no Jupiter, there is no Earth, there is nothing. When we say now, no today, v'yodato ayom, and place it on your heart that there is only God and none else, not none else, other gods. All the other nations, they have a God for rain, a God for sustenance, a God for health, a God for spouse, a God for... That's why you have names for the days of the week. Sunday is the day of the worshippers of the sun. Monday is the moon. Tuesday is another name. By the way, the Jewish months, the Hebrew months, most of them are named after idols. I, we don't have the, this is not a discussion, but Sivan, Tammuz, Av, Av is, is father in Hebrew. Elul is a name of idols. Because th those idols are nullified. But they had many uh, many gods, many statues, many objects they worshipped as gods. Jewish people, for us, it's only one, God and only one. Kabbalah goes deeper. Kabbalah says there is only God. There is no me, there is no you, there is no table, there is no chair, there is no computer, there is no generator, there is no car, nothing. It's all God. And the proof is, as we'll discover, as because if we are a real true existence, then God is limited. God is finite because the space that I take, God cannot be found. That's a simple way I, I, I find it Can you easy. Repeat it? Yeah, we say that God is unlimited, right? There's no limitations. If I am a true existence, so here inside of my body, there is no God. God is not there. It's me. So I am creating a limit to God. Anything that has, is finite, anything is limited, is also limited in time and space. Mm -hmm. So meaning there was a time or there was a situation where there was no God and there will be a time where there is no God. My God is endless. My God is limitless. If I am an, a true existence, I create a limitation to God. Ali, do you understand that? Very good. All right, so that's what we're getting there. We're starting. That's that's where we're going. So the first thing the rabbi is saying is that when we say I am you God, it comes to say. I am the only ex true existence. There is nothing else. We will get into details about how is it possible? How can we prove it? But I just shared with you a very simple proof that if I am a true existence, I am actually limiting God because my existence takes away God from where I take space. And therefore it creates limitations to God. God cannot be limited. God is infinite. 
Herman, you, you understand that, yeah. right? So therefore, says the rabbi, when again, I am going to say it many times, when we say in the Torah, I am God, God is one, we are to say God is the only one. There is none else. There is none else, not idols, those who defy God. There is none else, me and you and the galaxies. God is everywhere and everything. We have no space. We will later discover how it actually works. And uh, maybe I should show with you this story now. I'm not sure if it will be accepted well, So, but I'm going to show it anyway. There was a rabbi, a rabbi of a town called Zembin, Rebbe Vrom of Zembin. He had a question and he traveled to the Rebbe, to the Chabad Rebbe, the Rebbe Maharash, the Fort Lubavitch Rebbe in Russia. When he was waiting to enter into the private audience with the Rebbe, he saw there a heretic, a local heretic that denied God, denied the Torah, who was there also waiting for a consultation with the rabbi. So he turned to him and he says, I'm a Hasid, so I got to consult the Rebbe. But you, you, you don't believe in this stuff. Why are you here? He says, well, I have a real question that bothers me in from Tanya, and that's why I'm coming, because only the Rebbe can ex explain. So the rabbi asked him, what's your question? He says, it says in the Tanya here that there is nothing other than God, and everything else is, uh, everything else is totally nullified, don't exist. How is it possible? I get hurt. People offend me mentally. I am in a good mood, bad mood. Well, what do you mean? It's not an imagination. It's real. I touch things. I live. Some things I cannot do. Some things I can do because it's real. And the rabbi says to him, funny you should ask this question. I have the exact same question, except that I, my question is on the reverse. I says, I know for sure that God is the only existence. And how is it possible that I feel, that I get angry, that I get upset, that I cannot get up in the morning? If everything is God, the universe, and uh, I, I don't understand how come the universe and all its content is, is, is a real creation. So they decided to both to get the, the heretic and the rabbi to enter to the Rebbe and ask the question. So they came into the Rebbe Maharaj and they asked him, in Tanya it says that the universe does not exist, it's not real that humans are not real, angels are not real. It is only God. So the heretic says, how is it possible? I know for sure the universe is real. The rabbi asks, I don't know how it's possible because God is for real and only one. How is it possible there is a universe? And the rabbi said to them, you are both right. There is a real existence of the universe and the people. How do we know? Because it's said in the Torah that God created the universe with 10 utterances. So he did create something. It is not an imagination. It's not a dream. It's for real. However, it is so minuscule that it does not take any space in God's realm. And therefore, it's not real for God. In other words, and it will take you time, take time and we'll get into deeper into it. In other words, from God's perspective, we are, don't exist, totally non-existence. From our perspective, we don't see God, we don't feel God, we don't understand God's existence. So it depends where you're looking from. From our perspective, we are a real entity that exists, that has emotions and intelligence, and there, are, there is peace and war, and there is good mood, bad mood, etc. But from God's perspective, from the true perspective, there is nothing that exists. Now let's see it in the words of the Rebbe, and the Rebbe, the Rebbe is going to develop it into details. In order to elucidate this matter clearly, we must first briefly speak of the idea and the essence of the unity of God, who is called one and unique, that is, we must understand the essential meaning of the of this phrase, which lends itself to various interpretations, that there is only one God, one creator, that he is one being, not a compound of various powers, and so on. All believe, says the Rebbe, 
that he is one alone. It's a phrase that we say on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippurim, v'chol ma'aminim shehu levadoi, that we know that he is alone. Now, after creation, exactly as he was be before the world is create was created, when he was obviously alone, and since nothing else had yet come into being, so too, now after creation, nothing exists apart from him. As it is written in the prayer book, you are he who was before the world was created, and you are he who is since the world was created. The rabbi is going to bring support to the idea that there is nothing other than God. First, it says, Ani Hashem lo shiniti. I have never changed the world, the creation of the universe and all its galaxies had not affected God in any way, sh shape or form. In addition, we say we believe that you are God the same as before the world was created and after the world was created. Meaning the universe, creation of the universe has no effect on God whatsoever. If the meaning of this passage were only that God is eternal without beginning or end, it could have been stated simply, you were before the world was created. Why the circumlocution of you are he who was before the world was created and the same as after the world was created? In other words, it's clearly stated in our, in our sages that God, after the world created, the before the world created, was the same, no change. This emphasis provided by the repeated phrase, you are he who, means you're exactly the same he before and after creation, without any change. As it is written, I and Lord, the Lord have not changed since creation. God is still one alone, despite the presence of myriads being, myriad beings as the altar, because I'm to explain, for this world and likewise all the spernal worlds, do not affect any change in his unity by the having been created out of the state of nothingness. Just as God was a, one alone, single and unique before they were created, so he so is he one alone, single and unique after the world he created them. How can it be so? What of all the creatures that exist besides him? And the answer is, says Rabbi, yet it is so, because all is as not beside him as is absolutely non-existence. And the rabbi is going to, I'm going to show it to you. I'm, I'm going to get into some details. When I say I'm unique in, in a certain way, and I'm the only one in uniqueness, for example, the only child to a couple, I'm single. What happens if I marry? Am I still single? Yes or no? Why not? So, you're a single person, but you're married to somebody else, so you're a unit. Can I call myself still single? No. If I on Facebook I put single in my status, what will my spouse do? She will get really happy. Sure. <laughs> if I say I'm the only child, and then another child was born, can I be? Can I be the only child? I'm not the only child anymore, right? There's another, a sister, a brother. The idea of uniqueness the rabbi is asking is only when there is only one. But what happens if something else came into the picture? Then you're not unique anymore. How is it possible to say that God is unique? He's single before he got married and after he got married. He's the only child after a child was born. And that's what the rabbi is trying to address. The rabbi is going to go in to say that the value of everything God created is so minuscule, so little, that there's no value whatsoever. And I'm going to share with you the way the, the, way the rabbi explains. I need some help with math. How many words a person can speak in a minute? The average, 100. The research say that the average person speaks 100 words a minute. 
how many minute how many awards an hour if it's an if it's a, a hundred uh, i said to you a hundred uh, Six thousand. So for an hour, eighteen hours. Well, up about eighteen hours, assuming we don't speak while we sleep. Eighteen times six thousand is how much? A hundred and eight thousand. So in a day, a day, twenty-four hours, we we are able to speak the average one hundred and eight thousand words. How many in a year three, times 365 come out to 3 million 400, almost three and a half millions words a year. The average person speaks three, four, four point nine million words a year, double it by 80, although someone is celebrating his 86th birthday, and someone is celebrating 93rd, 94th uh, this week. But let's say 80 years. The average, because some people live shorter, 80 times 3.9 comes out to almost 3.5 billion words in our lifetime. That's the average. Do you know percentage-wise one word compared to 3.4 billion words is? It's P point zero 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 six. It's it's so so small. There's almost no value. Now compare one word of speech to a word of thought, thinking. No statistic goes about how many words per minute we think, but there is no doubt that it's at least a double at least 200 per minute. The distance, the difference between a word, a spoken word versus a word we think is not only quantitatively, it's not just many more words, but qualitatively. In other words, in one thought, I can have a thousand words and that thought is only five seconds. Do you understand that? Everybody understand that? There is a famous of the Arizal. There's a famous story of the Arizal who once he was uh, taking a nap on a Shabbos afternoon and the, the student saw that he was very active while asleep. He slept for an hour. So he's, the, when he woke up, they asked him, uh, what, what, was there anything special while you're taking a nap? He says, yeah, I went up to heaven and I studied Torah. So they said to him, can you show what you studied? He says, if I were to show with you what I start, just study, it will take three full lifetimes for you to sit and listen to me. Because spiritually, just like thought versus speech is way, way more, contains much more because it's qualitatively. So when I have an idea in my mind, if I am to express it in speech, just like writing is much slower than speaking. I can speak much faster, twice, three, four, five times as fast as writing. When it comes to thinking, the words that go, th go through my mind are much, much more. It's a greater quality. So now compare one spoken word to all the thoughts that go throughout our life. It's just unfathomable, the, dis the distance. The... Uh, one of the sages compared a spoken word to a thought word of thinking like a bar of gold to a grain of dirt, of soil. In other words, not just the size, it's the quality. You can't compare gold to dirt. One grain of dirt has no value. If I dropped it over here, you, you can still call the room very clean and you won't be able to find it because of its minuteness. Compare that to a bar of gold. Gold, bar of gold can give you, can get you retirement, can get you on a 150 day um, cruise. It can do stuff for you. That's one word of speech versus one word of thinking. That's the distance. 
So it's not just when I'm thinking, I say, I think many more words. It's also the quality. The way the mind works is much faster. So far, so good. Are we able to follow? Okay. How about uh, when you have less of a quality of a thought? You do, but we're talking about the average. And we're talking about the average person. Okay. Some people, the useless uh, <laughs> thoughts. We know that, right? <laughs> Back to our discussion. <laughs> How did God create the universe? Anybody? He spoke. God spoke. How many sentences God said? How many utterances? How many sentences? Uh, one sentence. Ten. Ten. God spoke 10 phrases, 10 sentences that included the entire universe, grass, trees, plants, animals, all the planets, stars, moon, sun, man, water, everything in 10 sentences. If me as a human being, finite, who has 80 years, who can speak 3.4 billion words in my lifetime, one word, has no value whatsoever. How much more so it is for something that forever exists? I'm not even comparing it to my mind, my my thought, my intelligence words, which the distance from a spoken word, one word, single word, is much, much far, far farther. Says the rabbi, this is the rabbi's revelation, and it will uh, able we will be able to address many, 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 many. Uh, difficulties in the Torah based on that understanding. So when God spoke and the world was created, it's a real world, but just like a piece of dirt, a little grain of dirt, of, of, of soil is in the in the floor here. I can step on it, it doesn't matter. I can keep it there, it doesn't matter. It does not have any change. So the words God used to create the universe are so little compared to God that God is one. So when I say, I need you to understand, so we can go back to the first two commandments. When God, I say God is one, not that there is no idol worshipers, not that there is no other gods, plural. God is one, Is God is the only real truth. God is the only true existence. Me, with all my emotions, all my achievements, all my greatness, all my past, all my future, together with all the generations from the creation of the universe till now, together with all the countries and cities and neighbors, neighborhoods, etc., have no value whatsoever. And therefore, there is only one God. You can't even put anything next to God. Is that clear so far? Why is it important? I'm going to share with you now. I'm going to give you the, 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 this part. Because when I serve God, when I do a mitzvah, when I help you by giving you good advice, when I tell the truth, when I have a, an opportunity to lie, I am connecting with God. I'm totally nullified. Remember in chapter 19, we spoke about humility. Here we're going to talk about a different type of humility. And that is to be included in God's realm. So when I serve God and please God by telling the truth, by keeping Shabbat, by eating kosher, what I do is I'm totally nullified, non-existence. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's not being seen. There is only God. So I fulfill the mitzvah. I am you, God. I am the only God. What happens if I lie? I tell a lie. I didn't keep kosher. I did not celebrate Passover. It doesn't matter to God. All matters is that I deviated from God's realm. Now I became a, new, a deity. I became an idol. What's the idea of an idol? Separated from God. You can be separated from God when you sin. So when I sin, I separate myself from God. I am an existence. So suddenly the spotlight Imagine there was a little dirt over here that God, nobody can see, nobody can sense. That's great. The room is clean. What if somebody puts the spotlight on that dirt? Now you can't call the room a clean room. 
That's the idea of sin. That's why any one of the commandments, the positive perform, fulfilling or staying away from is one of the two commandments. I am your God, thou shall not worship any other God. Because when I don't tell you the truth, or when I don't keep any of the precepts that God obey, asked me to follow, what I do is I move away from God. Now I'm an, my own entity. If I'm on my own entity, I'm separated from God. I'm separated from God. I disobey God in one of the two commandments. Did I make myself clear? This is a very deep idea and we will get into small, small, small pieces. So again, before I take a question, where the rabbi began by saying that the entire 613 commandments are in within the first two commandments of the 10 commandments. That's why God spoke them to us. Why is it so important? The rabbi goes on to say that when I say God is our Lord, God is one, or when we say God there is, not, is the only one and none else, we're not referring to other deities, other idols, we're referring to other existences. There is nothing Everything is totally not and nullified before God. And therefore, when I obey God, I keep the mitzvot or I stay away from negative, I'm still non-existence. I'm nullified. What happens the moment I disobey God? I'm rising against God. It doesn't matter what's the scene. It can be in my marriage. It can be in the holy temple. It can be in the synagogue. It can be on the street. Whatever is not obeying God, now I rise against God. Now I'm defying the, the God is the only one. And that disobeying, thou shall not worship any other God because I worship myself. That's the point that the Rabbi is going to talk about that will help us understand a little deeper the heart, the Jewish heart, as we'll get much, much later. And this, this point... Okay. Um, we have 613 commandments we have to follow. How many people, what percentage? Today of is impossible. Those 613 are impossible for one human being to fulfill. Some are for male, some are for female, some are for a king, some are for priests, some for the holy temple, some for Israel, some for someone who get married, some for someone who get divorced. I didn't get divorced. There is a mitzvah when you get divorced, someone wants to get divorced to do it in a certain way. It's impossible. The maximum today, the maximum a human being can achieve are 87 negative. <clears throat> Each one of them are all inclusive. You know, Shabbat is, is uh, many details, but 87. And I believe the positive are 101. So it's less than a third. But that means that someone is really, really observant and he keeps everything possible. Uh, he's a firstborn, he's a firstborn, he's a Koyan, he lives in the Holy Land, he travels, he's married, he got divorced. Uh, there is a lot of details. Uh, the, the, in the universe, there is a possibility for 87 negative uh, prohibitions and 101 positive. Not all of them can be kept by one year. Does that answer you? Any other questions? Harry, do you understand what we just studied? Okay, very good. Does that answer your question from before? Okay, let's continue. So the rabbi is going to tell us what follows is a lengthy exposition of this concept which is carried over into the next chapter. We are on page 283 in the middle. For the coming into being of all the upper and lower worlds out of nothingness and their life and their existence, that is, that force which sustains them so that they do not revert to nothingness and not as they were before they were created, I'm skipping in the next paragraph, is nothing other than the word of God and the breath of his mouth that is closed in these worlds. So here is another idea that the rabbi uh, is, is injecting here. When I create a, any creation, when I create a table and I put it for sale, the table will exist, assuming it's not on the, in, outside and the natural forces will destroy it, but the, the object will exist. 
when I build a house, if I follow the code and I use not Chinese drywall, but I use a little material, we assume the house will exist for many years. However, there are things that as soon as they are created, they disappear. Anybody has an example of something that we create and disappears as soon as it's done? Ah, food, why? Because we eat it it's gone. Good point. The power of speech, unlike action, I can break a chair, I can build a chair, but when I speak, you cannot find the words anymore. Why? You cannot bring them back. Why? As the rabbi will speak, that's because God, that's the idea of speech that God, the utterances that God spoke. God does not have a mouth. But the idea that God created the universe, it's not something that he did once, but it's something that he continuously doing. He needs to recreate. So right now, God recreates the universe just like in the six days of creation. Why? Because the power of speech. As soon as God spoke, if you want those words to exist, you have to say it again. And God keeps saying them. He doesn't get tired because he's not a human. So if I were to take something, a tree, and make a two by four from it and build a shelf or build a cabinet, the cabinet will exist. Because I took something from not, from something, I changed the shape and the form. And therefore, I can go away. I'm the creator. I can go away. And it's still there. The canvas that I put paintings on still exists. But if I take something from nothing, creating something from nothing, I need to be there continuously to recreate it. There are many, many examples. I've used different examples. I'll use one simple example that we study in yeshiva. When I was 14, I was introduced to it. I've never shared that before, but I hope that you can understand, you can relate to it. Imagine I throw a ball. I throw a ball or a rock up in the air. What, what happens after a while? The ball will co turn back and go down. Why? Gravity. We call it gravity. Hasidic Kabbalah teaching tells us it's not gravity. Kabbalah tells us that by nature, you can call gravity by nature. Actually, it's no contradiction, but the Kabbalah looks at it from a different angle. Kabbalah says that gravity is the natural order. Everything wants to go down, except the candle and the human soul. We discussed it before. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the rock naturally wants to come down, wants to remain here. What makes the rock fly high? The energy that vested in it for my hand. When I use, because the stronger I am, the, the higher the, the rock, the, the, the ball will fly. What happens when the energy ends? The ball will fall. Does someone have to be there to push the ball down? The answer is no. What happened was the energy ended. So I put, let's say, 50 pounds of energy. It goes 50 feet. I put 54 pounds of energy, it goes 54 feet. Naturally, the rock and the ball wants to be here. When you go and try to push it against its nature, you are creating something new, and therefore it's temporarily. It exists as long as the energy is there. What if over there someone stands and kicks it with his leg? Another 20 feet, there is, it, it received more energy. As long as there's more energy, it'll fly higher. Did you understand that? Yes or no? Am I going a little too far? The, the paragraph is skipping a good paragraph. Really? Yeah. Okay. We'll go back to it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's read it. We are about to finish. It. Unlike the product of a human craftsman, which is if le if left undisturbed will remain in exactly the same state and shape as it was when it left the hands of the craftsman. The continued existence of creation is dependent on the constant renewal of the creative power. Were this power to cease, all of creation will revert to nothingness. This force which animates and sustains the existence of all creation is nothing other than the word of God and the breath of his mouth that is clothed in this world. So if I want light, electricity if i pull the cord what happens 
There's no light. It's going to be dark because it's against nature. And therefore, it needs to continuously be connected to the source of energy. As soon as you pull it away from the energy source, it's going to be nothing. It's, there will be no light, even though the light bulb is in. The entire existence is from nothing. The entire existence of the universe, all of that, including every aspect, is only because God spoke, and that's the energy that creates the universe. And he needs to continuously speak in. So the idea the universe exists is because of God's speech. Remember I shared with you the one word versus our lifetime of words? Comparing to God, one word or, or the 10 phrases are so little that they mean of no value. The existence of God is what? proven by what you just said. What, what? What's the... uh, God's presence keeps us alive. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's not just God's presence, God's desire. Yeah. Because the moment God does not care about me, I don't exist. So if I, if God wants to destroy the universe, if I would pose this question to children, they would come and say, well, God can set a fire. God can set uh, water to destroy the universe. But always something will remain, ash. Ashes will remain. The water will destroy the universe, but there will be some soil, something will be left. According to Kabbalah, if God wants to destroy the universe, he stops speaking. He stops speaking. There will be nothing. Just like there is light that provides light or heat. As long as the energy is plugged, as long as the wire is plugged, if I pull the plug, there is no heat, there is no cooling, there is no light. Because it needs constant energized. The universe needs to be constantly moving, constantly like a heartbeat. And that exists only because God keeps speaking. As soon as God stops speaking, there will be no universe. Poof, gone. And therefore, that helps us understand how far God, how far the universes and all its content is from God. Now, next week, the rabbi will continue with the same, uh, on the same idea and get a little bit uh deeper but i shared with you the 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 real point is that therefore the first two commandments are all inclusive of all the ten commandments all of the 613 commandments and every time i disobey god we are forfeiting the second commandment thou shall not worship any other god and every time we fulfill a mitzvah we fulfill the mitzvah of i am you god who created heaven and earth because I am allowing God to be one. I'm allowing to myself to remove myself from my existence from the from the from God and let God permeate everywhere and everything. We'll continue next week, God. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah,